Hi everyone. Good to see you again. Nice to nice to be back for installment four. So this week we're going to be discussing challenging words. I think this is where things start to really get exciting. So here we are in uh, the fifth. It's not the fifth installment, but this is really the fifth point that I had come up with that affects translations. So the last two classes that we had were really about the translators themselves and their own biases and how those affected translations. So we talked about their personal context, just the time period that they lived in, and also their own beliefs and how those affected what the translators wrote down. This one's a little bit different. This is how knowledge of biblical languages has affected translations. So that's something that I have to tell you before learning about translation and before looking into this, this was something I never even thought about as far as affecting the way that we read the Bible. Now, I really want to put a disclaimer on this, though, before we start. We're not, again, we're not talking about salvation related things. This is really, you know, if you find yourself wondering, oh, why does this translation say this? Well, this other one says this. Learning about how the knowledge of biblical languages developed is something that can kind of shed some light on why translations are different. That's really what we're looking at. I mean, we're going to be considering an example here of where like the King James Version says nuts and the NIV says pistachios, right? And the NIV is more accurate that, you know, nuts is very general. Pistachios is clearly more specific. But my point is, is that more specific is better, you know, more accurate is better in this case. But does it really matter that you know that Jacob's sons brought pistachios instead of nuts? No, it really has absolutely no bearing on anything unless, you know, maybe if you get on Jeopardy someday or something and they ask you that. But, but this, it, it, you know, it's not, this is not a, wow, that changed my life sort of thing. But I think it's really interesting to just understand where these things come from. I think the more knowledge that we have of the process that goes on in our Bible translations, the better we can understand why they are the way they are. Okay. Just to underscore again, I really want to bring up this point that number one, the context is what determines how we understand a passage. That is not something we need Greek or Hebrew to know. The context is the major determiner. Okay. With that said, these other things also have an impact, but being able to read the context and being able to do it in English, right? That, that works and that's good. Okay. So we're going to discuss something called hapax legomena, the new uh, vocabulary term for you, perhaps. So we'll go into that, hapax legomena. Then we're going to discuss some changes and discoveries in language. And then we're going to see how these changes and discoveries take a long time. It's a long process to get these discoveries into what we have today in our Bibles. So basically, scholarship takes a long time. That's, that's the point of this. And people are still learning and working on things. Translation needs constant revision. That's the big message that I want us to take out of this. Again, not because somehow older versions are missing the gospel. It's not because of that, but just because you can get more specific and slightly more accurate as you are learning more about the languages and thus revising, which is rough as a translator. I just want to say, you know, I just finished translating the book of Jonah and I had to come to terms with the idea that I'm probably going to have to retranslate the book of Jonah in like 10 years again, <laughs> you know, when, when more about the languages learned, when my own background changes and I start to learn more about scripture, right? Things are going to change. So translation requires constant revision. And I, I don't think we should ever say this one that we have is the one. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Here's the why question. This is an important one. Why does the discovery of Ugaritic have anything to do with the Bible? Now, I think that this is helpful, particularly because uh, I remember hearing someone once say, well, I looked this up. I looked up this word 
in my lexicon. And the lexicon said, in Ugaritic, this word means whatever. And their response to that was, this is Christadelphian, their response to that was, I don't care what it meant in Ugaritic. I care what it meant in Hebrew. And so they dismissed the Ugaritic. And that's fine. But what we want to see is, yeah, why does the lexicon even have that there? You know, why do we care about Ugaritic? Why does that actually even make a difference? And maybe I should just preface that with, and what is Ugaritic? <laughs> so, so we'll talk about that too. Okay, let's discuss Hapax Legomena. First of all, I want to tell you it is not a cat, in case you're looking at that picture and trying to figure out, you know, how this relates at all. That's what it looks like in Greek. So this is, if you were to pronounce this in Greek, this would be Hapax Legomena. And if you were to pronounce it in Greek, the singular form, so that hapax legomena is plural, hapax legomenon is the singular form. Okay, let's just talk about what this means, this term. This is a term that translators throw around a lot. If you were to translate it literally out of Greek, it would literally mean being said once. What that means is, this is a word that occurs one time in the entirety of the Bible. So those are hapax legomena. Hapax legomena are words that occur one time in the Bible. Or if you want to talk about one of these words, you would call it a hapax legomenon. Okay. So that's why, by the way, there's, you know, a colored cat and everything else is black and white, right? It's the one that occurs. Anyway, it's hard to get pictures for abstract things. Okay, so this is this I thought was a helpful definition, words that are used only once in scripture. Now, this is something that I don't think we think about really all that much. I can admit to you, I didn't really think about it at all. But just to show you that this is really a thing, I have compiled a list for you. These are all the hapax legomena in the Gospel of Matthew. Now notice, we start here at Matthew 2 verse 6. We end at Matthew 12, verse 20. Now, those are just the ones from chapter 2 to chapter 12. This is from chapter 12 to chapter 22. This is from chapter 22 to chapter 27. And then there's 27 and 28. So if you look back over this, you know, you might at first say, well, why is that a big deal? Like, Hapax Legomena, these words only occur once. Why does that matter that much if I don't totally understand what they mean? Well, the problem is, is that there's a lot of these kind of words. And so if you were to say, well, I don't know how to translate any of these hapax legomena, you're going to start having a lot of holes. That's my point. So now I just want to show you, here's the hapax legomena in all of the New Testament. So here's Matthew. There's 89 of them. Mark has 67. Luke has, look at this, 221. John has 68. Acts has 326, Romans has 85, 1 Corinthians 79, 2 Corinthians 64, Galatians 28, Ephesians 35, Philippians 36, Colossians 32, 1 Thessalonians 18. By the way, in case you're feeling sorry for me and thinking that I counted all these, I'll, I'll tell you that I didn't. <laughs> I got this from somebody else who counted them all. So 2 Thessalonians 8, 1 Timothy 65, 2 Timothy 46, Titus 27, Philemon has five. Hebrews 126, James 53, 1 Peter 55, 2 Peter 47, 1 John 1, 2 John 1, 3 John 2, Jude 14, and Revelation 74. Now, I'll just let you kind of look at these numbers for a little bit and see if you notice any interesting trends. Consider who wrote some of these books. And the number of these unique vocabulary words that they have. For instance, do you notice the books that have the most of them? Appears to be Luke. Yeah. So there you go, right? Dr. Luke with all of his big vocabulary words. <laughs> so he has all these words that don't occur in the rest of the Bible, right? I mean, 326 of them in Acts. 
Okay. Which by the way, is part of, if you've ever heard somebody say that they think that Luke wrote Hebrews, I'm not advocating that by the way, but if you've heard somebody say that part of the reason that they will often bring up is they will say things like the Greek of Luke and Acts are similar to the Greek of Hebrew of Hebrews. And what they mean by that is there's a lot of unique words. So you will notice that, right? Hebrews is the third, the third book with the most of these. How about John? Do you notice what's going on with John? 68 of them, right? And John's a pretty big gospel. And then first John has one, second John has one, third John has two, right? Apparently John uh, wasn't real big on vocabulary uh, as far as, you know, the, using all the words. And um, this is one of the reasons why a lot of times Greek students, so people that are learning Greek are often encouraged to start with the gospel of John <laughs> because it's, it's simpler. So I want to show you a little diagram here. There's, by the way, in the entire New Testament, there's 1,672 of these words. So this isn't just something that we can say, oh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it, it occurs a lot. Okay. These are the ones that have the most. Um, proportionately. So these, these books, in proportion to the amount of words total, have the most hapax legomena. These ones have the least. So I want to show you an interesting diagram. Those of you who are in my um, Hebrew classes, or sorry, in my Greek class, you might recognize this. We talk about this sometimes. Um, translators like to classify the different New Testament books according to how easy they are to read. So the easier ones are on the left and the harder ones are on the right. And really what, what these categories are, like they call them Semitic or vulgar. What that really means is they don't use a lot of vocabulary words. They don't use a lot of these hapax legomena. And you'll see the ones that we were talking about, Mark, John, right, Revelation. And the ones that are literary koine, that's supposed to be like refined. Those are ones like Luke, Acts, James, Jude. So kind of interesting to see where, you know, if you've ever heard somebody say stuff like, well, the Greek of this book is different than the Greek of that book. And you've wondered like, what, you know, how can, how can Greek be different than Greek? Right. And you've, you've tried to figure out like, how, how's that work? That this is one of the big reasons why, why people say that kind of thing, because some books will have more hapax legomena proportionally than other books would. Okay. Now the question then becomes, well, why do they make translation more difficult, right? Can't you just say, oh, I haven't seen this word before. It doesn't really show up anywhere else. I'll just look it up in the lexicon and use their definition, right? Well, why can't you say that? Any ideas? How much more resources do they have than we have in the Hebrew text or the Greek text? Yeah, so that's the issue, right? They can't ask that. Lex lexicographers, you like that word? <laughs> so, so people who make lexicons, they would love to ask those questions, right? They would love to be able to say, oh, well, you know, I'll just go to my other lexicon and see what that says. But they can't, right? Because they're the ones who develop the definition. So, so the problem is, is that if you are trying to come up with a definition, what you normally do, and what we do as Christadelphians, which we should, is we say, oh, I wonder how this word is used in other passages, right? So you say, okay, let me, let me look at this, uh, this word in other passages. And you say, oh, oh, it's not used in any other passages, <laughs> right? And that is the struggle. Lexicographers do the exact same thing as us. They have the same resources that we have. As, as Bill was saying, they have the same resources we have. And so they want to look at other passages just as much as we do. And with Hapax Legomena, they, they can't. So that's the issue. So let me show you what they do. Okay. Here's an example of one of these Hapax Legomenas. Then with the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. So this is Matthew 22, 15. Our Hapax Legomena is this word right here, the word entangle. I've underlined it in the English and the Greek. It's the word entangle. 
Problem is, is that how do we actually know it means entangled? Because it only ever shows up one time. So, you know, it could mean anything. It could mean like dance or something, right? Like, it's like who knows? Okay. Well, it does, it is constrained by context. Okay. So now we know it doesn't, it can't mean dance, first of all. <laughs> but it's got to mean something that the Pharisees would want to do to Jesus in his talk, right? So that's how context helps us, number one. Problem is, is that there's a lot of things they could want to do to him, potentially. So here's what lexicographers do. This is Thayer's lexicon. Thayer does this. He says, here's your word, pagiduo. He says it's ourist, subjunctive, third person, plural, and he gives you blah, 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 all this stuff. Here's a definition. And now look at what he does. He says, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12. Ah, so what he has now done is he said, okay, well, let's go out of the New Testament record and let's take a look and see how this word is used in the Septuagint, right? So now you can look at the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, and you can see how the word is used there. So that's really nice. That's one of those good things about those hapax, some of those hapax legomenas. You can look them up in the Septuagint. Now, unfortunately, if you're looking at a hapax legomena that's Hebrew, you don't have that luxury. You know, you, you can't say, oh, I'll just look at the Hebrew New Testament. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't really work. I mean, you could. There are Hebrew New Testaments, but they're not like the Septuagint was. Okay, so what happens then is if the word is in the Septuagint, lexicographers can say, aha, you know, now we'll go and look at what the Septuagint says. Good. If it's not in the Septuagint, well, then, you know, lexicographers are just sad for a while. And, and what they have to do next is they then have to say, okay, well, let's start pulling out the church fathers, and we're going to see if they use these words at all. <laughs> Problem with the church fathers is you're looking at, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 years after the New Testament was written, right? And by that point, the word could have totally meant something else. So that's a little difficult, but I just, I want to point out here, a lot of lexicons now attempt to incorporate definitions from early Christian literature as well, because of things like Hapax Legomena. And they'll tell you, you know, we got this word from Clement of Alexandria in this passage, and here's how he used it, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's, this is what linguists and grammarians do. They put together definitions from other sources, which involves their own bias, by the way, which is why we do our own word studies. Now, here's where it gets really tricky, though. What should a translator do when they look at the Septuagint and they say, ah, alas, it's not in the Septuagint. And then they look at all the writings of the church fathers, which is a lot and a pain to go through. And they say, alas, that word's not used in the church fathers either. You know, maybe Luke just like made it up, right? That's possible. He could have done that. What do they do then? Okay. Well, here's what the King James translators did. There be many words in the scriptures, and they put in little brackets, hapax legomena, right? There's, that's what we're talking about. So there's all these words in the scriptures, which be never found there but once. <laughs> and they, they try and be all poetic here. Having neither brother nor neighbor, as the Hebrews speak. So, you know, they, ha they have no friends, basically, these words. So that we cannot be holpen by conference of places. Again, there be many rare names of certain birds, beasts, and precious stones, etc., concerning which the Hebrews themselves are so divided among themselves for judgment, right? Have you ever tried to do a study of like the breastplate? You know, if you try and study the breastplate of the high priest, you get all confused because you'll notice that every translation has different stones. And if you talk to like a rabbi, the rabbi will tell you one thing and you'll look at all your translations and you'll say, oh, that's different than what every translation says too. You know, the issue is, is that some of these words people still haven't figured out. So this, the King James translators are talking about that. You know, there's these precious stones that we don't know what to do with. They say, here's what we did. In such a case, doth not a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that preemptorily. For 
as it is a fault of incredulity to doubt of those things that are evident, so to determine of such things as the spirit of God hath left, even in the judgment of the judicious, questionable, can be no less than presumption. What they're saying here is there were just some words we didn't know. They were hapax legomena. We just kind of guessed. <laughs> so, so if you've ever wondered why you get things like badger skins, um, like all kinds of animals that wouldn't have been around at the time, these precious stones that you look at and you think, I don't think it means that. Well, that's because in a lot of cases they were guessing and they will tell you that in the margin. You know, they'll say, this is what the Hebrew says. And we don't totally know. Okay. Well, what's interesting about now is that in the mid 1800s, archeology span in the Levant area in the Middle East just kind of exploded onto the scene. And all kinds of information was discovered about these ancient languages. So look at this. This is now what is suggested in the modern times. Okay, this book here was published in 2003, and this is now what lexicographers do. So in the King James's time, they just had to say, eh, we don't know. We're going to put a marginal note in here. Now what happens is they consult the various cognate languages. So cognate means they sound the same. So they like have connections in terms of, of their, uh, their background. So it'll go on to list what some of those are to find additional, including contrasting usages, especially so those for those words, which occur infrequently in the Bible or even only once hapax legomena for Hebrew. One may often consult the grammars and lexicons for Ugaritic Akkadian cuneiform, both Babylonian and Assyrian Arabic Aramaic, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and at times even Coptic. What this guy here is saying is that Hebrew is highly related to these other word, these other languages. So it's fascinating that I know Hebrew, I don't know Arabic, but there have been times where I have seen Arabic words and I have said, oh, I know what that means because it's the same word as Hebrew, you know, the, the word in Hebrew for night is Lila. The word for night in Arabic is Lila. So you can, you can kind of figure that out because they're cognate languages. So in other words, what happens here is lexicographers will say, oh, wait, this word doesn't occur anywhere else, but does it occur in Ugaritic? Does it occur in Akkadian? How is it used in all these other languages? Is it used in the same way? And maybe that can enlighten us a little bit on what this word means. Okay. So uh, we're going to skip this. This lady uses too many big words. I don't like it. it. It basically says the same thing. Okay. So what I want to show you, oops, is here's an example of a hapax legomena in the Old Testament. This is Genesis 41, verse 43. This is about Joseph, and it's when Joseph is exalted and made the second ruler in Egypt. King James says, he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried before him, bow the knee. He made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, the time the King James was published, people didn't really know what to put here. So the translators assumed you know, he's riding in the second chariot. People are crying something in front of him. He's made the ruler. He's probably that he's being told, people are being told to bow, right? So they translated it as bow the knee. Now, there's nothing there about knees. Um, uh, that's just what the King James translators added in. Now, what you will see in newer translations is that they have now translated in a slightly different way. They translated it as kneel down or make way. Now, if you're wondering, well, why is it different? Why did it go from bow the knee to kneel down and make way? Here's the reason. This is from Brown Driver Briggs, which is considered one of the best Hebrew lexicons. Uh, this is just a screenshot from Blue Letter Bible. So if you ever use Blue Letter Bible, they have Brown Driver Briggs built into it, which is really nice. So look at what Brown Driver Briggs says. Many, well, meaning dubious, right? They don't totally know, but many Egyptian derivatives proposed. So what they're saying is we looked back at Egyptian 
and Egyptian helped us understand what this meant. So in Coptic Egyptian, it means prostrate yourself. This word does. In other Egyptian, it means give attention. So you can kind of see where the newer translations are getting their information from. They're getting it from Egyptian. Okay, and then here's Assyrian. The same word in Assyrian appears to be a title like Grand Vizier. So there you go. Okay, now I just want to go through quickly some of the discoveries that have happened, that have taken place over time, because it's fascinating to know about and just to see how this works on a historical timeline. So there's a picture there. You perhaps know what that is that we're looking at. That's the Rosetta Stone. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. First, I want to talk to you about Akkadian. So we're going to go in chronological order. I apologize. That's how my brain works. I, uh, I got to do things in relation to time. So Akkadian was discovered before hieroglyphics were deciphered. So let's talk about Akkadian. Anybody here ever heard of that before? Akkadian? Yep. Martha, I, I think you're going to learn Akkadian. If I'm I do too. I'm excited. It's, it's part of the curriculum. Yeah, so there you go. So Akkadian is Assyrian, essentially. So what happens, this is kind of like old Assyrian. And um, what happened with Assyrian language is it started out as Akkadian, and then it eventually morphed into Aramaic. And then Aramaic bled into um, Judaism when the Jews became captives in Babylon. So kind of interesting history there. So Akkadian is important to us because, you know, there was a lot of interaction that the Jews had with Assyria, right? Now, here's the thing. Nobody even knew that Akkadian existed until 1767. Isn't that crazy? Like this language was just gone. And at one point, somebody discovers something with Akkadian on it. And they say, what is this? You know, we don't know. And scholars start to look at it and try and figure out, you know, what is it? Well, here's something that I really want to highlight. Notice it was discovered in 1767. And there weren't breakthroughs in it until the mid 1800s. This is like 100 years later. That's one of the fascinating things about scholarship on these languages. Um, it takes a long time and it's really hard. <laughs> so, so that's one of the reasons that it's important why we always want to be looking at the latest translations because they will be incorporating the latest research. Okay, so here's just an instance, by the way, if you weren't aware, Akkad is actually mentioned in the Bible. So Akkad would be where the Akkadian language came from. And you'll notice you have these Assyrian connections, right? The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. This is Nimrod. So Akkadian was Nimrod's language. So check that out. Okay. So here we have Nimrod's language. Here's the kingdom of Akkad. This is right around the time of Abraham. So Akkad is this green part. So this is really where Abraham would have come from. You know, Ur would have been part of Akkad. Okay. So that was the discovery of Akkadian. Now, the discovery of hieroglyphics happened a little bit later, and it was discovered through the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is very interesting. I don't know if you know the history of this, but basically everybody knew that hieroglyphics existed, but nobody could figure out what they were, like what they meant, because um, it's so different. You know, they couldn't figure out, like, does this symbol mean like a letter? Like, does it mean a sound or does it mean a thing, right? Is it like a whole picture? So they couldn't, they couldn't figure out if the symbols were letters or pictures. And the Rosetta Stone ended up having three languages on it. It had hieroglyphics at the top. It had Demotic in the middle, which was a, uh, like an Egyptian priestly language. And then it had classical Greek at the bottom. Now, again, this still doesn't totally help. Like, Scholars looked at it when it was first discovered and they said, aha, we know Demotic and we know classical Greek. But they still couldn't figure out the hieroglyphics because even though they know these all say the same thing, they couldn't figure out what part of the hieroglyphics match this part in Greek. You know, they, they couldn't put it together, right? So they just kind of looked at it for a long time and they thought, oh, this is interesting. You know, we don't, we don't really know. It was actually discovered by Napoleon. 
who knew, right? Napoleon is the reason that we know about, uh, about hieroglyphics. So it's discovered on July 15, 1799, 35 miles north of Alexandria by one of Napoleon's soldiers. They discover it, they read it, and it's kind of like really boring. It basically says, Ptolemy V, the king of Egypt, made this pillar, <laughs> right? And people are kind of like, oh, cool. You know, that's great. Like, what do we do with this? We don't know. So they, they put this stone down and people don't really think about it. Okay. Well, what happens is one scholar finally is looking at this thinking, you know, this has got to be the key to figuring out hieroglyphics. We know the hieroglyphics mean something. We know that they're a language, but we can't figure them out. And finally, it comes together with this French scholar who apparently was like really bad natured. I, you know, everything I found about him was about how like people didn't like him. So I don't, you know, I don't know. It was, he figured out the Rosetta Stone and people didn't like him. That was, that was like the two big things about it. So what he did is he recognized, wait a minute, there's these like specific circles around hieroglyphics. And he theorized that these circles around the hieroglyphics were the names of kings. They were the names of royalty. This was his hypothesis. And he looked at the symbols and he started to give sounds to them. And he found out he was able to match it up with the Greek. You know, he'd look at the Greek and he'd say, okay, oh yeah, here's a king's name in the Greek. I wonder if that matches this hieroglyphic with this circle around it. And he figured out, yeah, this theory is actually correct. And so by deciphering the royalty names on the Rosetta Stone, he was able to decipher all of the hieroglyphics. This was him, Jean-Francois Champollion, or whatever. I don't know French, but uh, that's, that's who he was. So he figured out some of the signs of the hieroglyphics, and after decades and decades, was able to figure out what the Rosetta Stone said and essentially rediscovered hieroglyphics. Problem is, is that unlike our language, which has only a handful of letters, hieroglyphics has over 700 symbols, and we're actually still learning about it, right? So my point here is that you never want to say, oh, well, I was looking at this language book from like 1750, and it told me this about this, you know, Greek word. That's not a good idea, because, <laughs> because probably in the last 250 years, people have figured out more about that language. Here's Ugaritic. Get this. This was discovered on accident in 1929 by French archaeologists. They were digging in Lebanon and came across this, these like markings on stone. And they were like, oh, look, it's cuneiform writing. Interesting. I guess it's Akkadian, right? Because Akkadian is cuneiform. They compare it to Akkadian and they say, oh, it doesn't look the same. This appears to be different. And so they keep digging and they realize, wait a minute, we just found a city so they've named it Ugarit is the city. And this city had its own language, which they call Ugaritic, similar to Akkadian, but it's not the same. Now, what's crazy about this is scholars until 1929 had no idea, number one, that Ugarit existed as a place. And number two, that Ugaritic even existed as a language, right? So, so in the last hundred years, they have discovered this language which is extremely similar to Hebrew. So there you go. There's where Ugarit was. And here's Israel. Sorry, it's, it's up in Syria. I think I said Lebanon earlier. Okay. So in 1965, now I, I have to preface this, you know, I was just telling you don't use outdated research. So here's my... <laughs> Here's my, uh, my disclaimer. 1965, I want to acknowledge the Dead Sea Scrolls at this point had been discovered. They were discovered in 48. But, but they were not examined yet in 1965. And the reason I'm saying that is because what this guy, what this uh, archaeologist here says in 1965 would have changed after people realized what the Dead Sea Scrolls were. But that nonetheless, I think this quote highlights how important Ugaritic is. So here's what he says. 
that Ugaritic is the greatest literary discovery from antiquity since the decipherment of the Egyptian hieroglyphics and Mesopotamian or Akkadian cuneiform is generally recognized. That it lies closer than any other literature to the Hebrew Bible is also well known. This does not mean that the ethical and moral heights reached in the Bible are to be found in Ugarit. If they're not about the same stuff, you know, Ugarit very much worshiped Baal. The analogies are literary rather than spiritual. Indeed, the Hebrew view is to a great extent a conscious reaction against the Canaanite milieu. So a lot of the things that you find in the Ugaritic writings, the Bible is actually like fighting against that because these are the people, this is where Baal came from. Okay, so the point here is Ugaritic was a big, big deal when it was discovered. Kind of blew the minds of linguists that here was this language very similar to Hebrew that nobody even knew existed. Okay, so that's the Old Testament. Now let's talk a little bit about the New Testament. This is very intriguing. So in the New Testament, it's Greek. Now, thankfully, every people have spoken Greek for centuries and centuries, and Greek did not die out as a language. So that kind of helps us. Okay. However, Koine Greek, which is what, it's the form of Greek that the New Testament is written in, is not a form of Greek that exists in a lot of documents, or at least a few hundred years ago, people didn't think it did. So I want to read you this interesting quote. This says, before the beginning of the 20th century, so we're talking like um, 1900s, right before the beginning of the 1900s, in large part because the discovery of Egyptian papyri had not yet been profitably assessed in terms of the language of the New Testament. So we're going to talk about those Egyptian papyri. There was a widespread and persistent belief in some circles that the Greek of the New Testament constituted a special biblical dialect, possibly even a divinely inspired or Holy Ghost Greek. Here's, here's what this means. People looked at the Koine Greek in the New Testament, and they looked at other Greek sources that we have. Herodotus, Homer, right? They're going through these like other Greek writers, and they're thinking like, whoa, the way the New Testament uses Greek is very different than these other writers. And so a lot of scholars at the time come up with this idea that, well, you know what? It's written in Greek, but it's a special Greek that God inspired that was only used in the New Testament. And that was it. Nobody else ever used it. Okay. And so for hundreds of years, that's what people thought. They figured it was a Holy Spirit Greek. Okay. Well, that kind of blew up as, as people started to make discoveries of papyri. So in Herculaneum, this is a city that was covered in volcanic ash. Excavations were done, and in 1752, a number of papyri were found. Now, these ones didn't really shed a whole lot of light on the New Testament because uh, they were different Greek. But my point is, is that these papyri were found, and 50 years later, people started to decipher them. So it took a while. Okay. There were more papyri that were found in the early 1800s in Egypt, but these, again, they didn't really have relation to the Greek of the Bible. They were magical papyri. So, you know, if you wanted to like do something bad to somebody you didn't like, you know, you'd pull out one of these and like, ooh, do do and like say the Greek in those and, you know, make something bad happen to them or whatever. So, so these papyri in, in the early 1800s were found, and again, they didn't really shed a whole lot of light on the situation. So in 1863, I want to tell you about J.B. Lightfoot. You maybe have heard of him. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of commentaries that are still used today. He gave a lecture, and this is what he said. If we could only recover letters that ordinary people wrote to each other without any thought of being literary... We should have the greatest possible help for understanding the language of the New Testament generally. So what he's saying is, if we could just find like normal writing that's similar to the New Testament, where somebody's not trying to be all fancy, you know, or somebody's not trying to cast a curse on somebody else or whatnot, if we could just find normal kind of writing that matches the New Testament and the Greek, that would be so helpful for us in understanding the New Testament. Well, guess what happened? In 
the 18th century, more papyri were found. And in the final years of the 19th century, the jackpot was hit. So these guys here, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt in 1896, decided to go seek their fortune in Egypt as English explorers. They did so by going to a place with the most awesome name. They went to a place in Egypt called Oxyrhynchus. So they went to Oxyrhynchus, these two guys, and they decided that in order to bring themselves fame, in order to increase scholarship, they were going to look for manuscripts of the Bible. And they went to Oxyrhynchus because that was a major Egyptian city back in the early centuries, um, like the first, second, third century. So they went to Oxyrhynchus and they thought, you know what, we'll just dig around, see what we find. So they start digging, start digging, and they specifically go to garbage dumps because they have this theory that maybe people threw stuff away and like those papyri will still exist, right? You know, like we'll find their receipt or something like that from when they went to the store. Like, so that's what they were looking for. So there they are in their team digging. Here they are in 1903 digging. So you'll notice they dug for a long, long time and they discovered something that was papyri, a piece of papyri. And they started to read it and it said, these are the sayings of Jesus. And now, I, you know, I don't know what their reaction was. I'm sure that, you know, they probably went, ah, and, you know, ran around and all that kind of thing. We can't believe this. So they found this papyri. And as they kept digging, they suddenly realized that in this garbage dump was like mounds and mounds and mounds of somebody's playing the piano. Let me go ask them to stop real quick. I don't know if you can hear that. Can you stop playing the piano, please, Gracie? I'm giving my class right now. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So they found mounds and mounds of papyri. Some were things like receipts. You know, I bought one cow from this person on this day, that kind of thing. And others were some of the oldest fragments of the biblical text in existence, right? They just hit this jackpot, which was crazy. And the reason that this was such a big deal, number one is because it was some of the oldest fragments of the Bible, right? That's a huge deal. And in addition to that, finding things like the receipts was also really helpful because it disproved that idea that this was Holy Spirit Greek, right? They found the same Greek written for just normal everyday stuff. And, and suddenly, all those hapax legomena in the New Testament, they had tons of material to compare it with. Okay, look at this. It's estimated that they found hundreds of thousands of papyri. And right now, get this. Those hundreds of thousands of papyri are sitting in boxes, untranslated. Because there's nobody to translate them. Look at this. There are, in fact, so many papyrus leaves and fragments, hundreds of thousands, right? Like, that's tons. That in 2011, the Oxyrhynchus team at Oxford University launched a project called Ancient Lives, which was designed to crowdsource transcriptions of unedited papyri to provide a sort of top of the funnel to the huge mass of papyri that have yet to be studied to prioritize the remaining papyri for further study. See below how to join in this effort. I mean, can you believe this? Like this means that in these boxes of hundreds of thousands of papyri, there could be like first century biblical manuscripts just like sitting there in this museum. But you know, we don't know because they're waiting for people to translate those. Okay, so to put this on a timeline, here's what we got. Akkadian is discovered in the middle of the 1700s. Rosetta Stone discovered at the end of the 1700s. Greek connected to papyri vocabulary, all these papyri discovers, discovered in the late 1800s, Oxyrhynchus papyri discovery, Ugaritic discovered, 1929. Now look at this. Here's when the KJV was translated. Here's when the KJV was updated. So this is what most of us read from when we read from the KJV. 
Let me read from the 1769 version. The RV was translated here. The RSV was translated here. NIV was translated here. The ESV translated here. Now, I think that this is really helpful because it gives you an idea of what resources these translation teams had at their disposal when they were trying to figure out what do these words mean. So for instance, you know, some people really like the RV uh, because they say it really updates the King James and that's good. And so on one hand, that is nice, but look, it might be a lot better in the Hebrew because Akkadian and Egyptian had been unearthed, right? But for the Greek, the breakthrough in Greek hadn't happened yet. So the RV might be good for the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it's not going to work out as well probably as one of these newer ones. So anyway, that, that's something interesting to think about. Now, here's the other piece of this. I had said that things like Akkadian took 100 years before people really figured out what was going on, right? Same thing with the Oxyrhynchus papyri. I mean, it was discovered late 1800s, and here we are with boxes of them sitting in England with people not translating them. So even though these things have been discovered, we're still waiting to be able to incorporate everything in these discoveries into our translations. It's a long process. So translating after a discovery doesn't mean that the translations include that discovery. Documents have to be made public. Scholars have to spend time looking at it, coming to conclusions. So I want to show you this. Check out how this works. I'm going to show you some, some instances of translation changing over time. Okay, and here's where we're going to get the pistachios. So here's the, here's the Bishop's Bible, all right? Bishop's Bible, 1568, says, Their father Israel said unto them, If it must needs be so, now then do this. Take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels. Bring ye man a present, a curtsy of balm, a curtsy of honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. Geneva Bible says the same thing there. It says nuts, right? It says nuts. Bishop's Bible says nuts. You'll notice... Your King James Version also says nuts, which is the 1769 version. Okay, so balm, honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, almonds. Here's the new King James. Look at this. Do you see what it says? Pistachio nuts. NIV says pistachio nuts. The Net Bible from 2017 says pistachios. So balm, honey, spices, myrrh, pistachios, and almonds. So there's been this change here. Nuts has turned into pistachios. Does this change your life? No, but it's interesting to see how this works. So all the new translations say pistachios. Let's take a look at why. Here's the word. It's botnim. Botnim in Hebrew, that's your strongest number. Now, if we were to look this up in Gesenius, so Gesenius is considered a, a relatively good lexicon. Here's what he says. Pistachia, right? All right, nice. So Gesenius tells us that. What's funny is you'll notice he doesn't tell you any reason that he thinks it's pistachio. He just says pistachia, that's what it is. And then he goes on to say, this word is unknown to the other cognate languages. Want to know why he says that? He says, the cognate languages don't know anything about this word. Here's the reason. Because Gesenius was first published in 1833. And at that point, the knowledge of Akkadian, even though it had been discovered, the knowledge of Akkadian hadn't yet been published. So Gesenius publishes his lexicon and he says, well, I think it's pistachio. Like that makes the most sense to me, but I don't really know. I can't actually prove that it means that. <laughs> so, so Gesenius just kind of like takes the shot in the dark at saying, I think it's a pistachio, but I couldn't check any cognate languages. So he doesn't give a reason for this gloss. You'll notice that Strong does the same thing, probably following Gesenius. Um, Strong's lexicon came after Gesenius. It was published in 1890. Okay, well, because both Strong and Gesenius don't explain where their translations come from, it's fascinating to see what translations from the 1800s decided to do. Look at this. They're just like all over the place. 
So Young's literal translation from 1862 says nuts. Darby's translation from 1890 says pistachio nuts. The RV says nuts, right? Like people just couldn't really decide, I guess. You know, it, it, they weren't sure. Like Gesenius says, I think it's this. Strong says, I think it's this, but nobody gives any proof. Okay, fast forward now to 1907. This is when the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon came into existence. And it's a big deal that it's over 100 years old and still considered one of the best. So here's what they say. The last revision of Gesenius was made in 1854. And the editor, Robinson, died in 1863. The last English edition of Gesenius, prepared by Tregellis, that doesn't really matter, likewise included editions from the Thesaurus, that was another of Gesenius's books, dates as far back as 1859. They're explaining now, here's why we've written a new lexicon. They're saying, look, Gesenius's stuff is good, but it's 50 years old at this point. In the meantime, look at what's happened in the last 50 years, they say. Semitic studies have been pursued on all hands with energy and success. The language and the text of the Old Testament have been subjected to a minute and searching inquire before unknown. The languages cognate with Hebrew have claimed the attention of specialists in nearly all civilized countries. There was this explosion of study in these cognate languages. Wide fields of research have been opened and the very existence of which was a surprise have invited explorers. Arabic, ancient and modern, Ethiopic with its allied dialects, Aramaic and its various literatures and localities have all yielded new treasures. While well, the discovery and decipherment from inscriptions from Babylonia and Assyria, Phoenicia, Northern Africa, Southern Arabia, and other abodes of Semitic peoples have contributed to a far more comprehensive and accurate knowledge of the Hebrew vocabulary and its sources and its usage than was possible 40 or 50 years ago. So they say, here's why we did it. Like, there's been this explosion of new language. And so if you look at this word, pistachio in Brown Driver Briggs, look at this. They say it's pistachio. Here's why. Because we can see from the Assyrian that that's how it's used, which is Akkadian. So now they explain. Okay. Now, here's, a, here's one more example. This is the Bishop's Bible. King of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish. The Geneva Bible says King of Assyria sent Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabshakeh from Lachish. King James says King of Assyria sent Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabshakeh from Lachish. Okay, so he sends these three people. Now, if you were reading these three Bibles, you get the sense that there's three people who are sent, and their names are Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabshakeh. Right? It's the name of the people. Tartan, Rabsaris, Rabshakeh. And yet, let's read it in the New King James. Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh from Lachish. Now, that's not normally what you do with people's names, right? You wouldn't say, you know, we're going to have the Jason give class tonight, right? That would be, <laughs> that sounds really weird. So what's going on here? You'll in fact see that this is what every new translation does. In fact, the NIV doesn't even say Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabshakeh. It says Supreme Commander, Chief Officer, and Field Commander. What's going on? Well, we figured out now that these are titles. Here's how people found out. There's the word tartan. It's not actually a hapax legomena. I'm sorry, it's used twice. <laughs> but it's similar, right? Here's what Gesenius says from 1850s. Gesenius says tartan, a general of Sargon and of Sennacherib. Do you see this here? P-R-N, that means proper noun. Proper noun, in other words, it means a name. So Gesenius says, this is a name. You know, he didn't have anything else to go on. He couldn't, he couldn't read it in Assyrian because nobody knew Assyrian at the time. So, so he looks at it and he's like, well, I guess that's somebody's name. So that's what he puts in his lexicon. He writes proper name. So, so when Strong writes his lexicon, he just says a foreign derivation. That's it. He doesn't, he doesn't really know. But because they had Akkadian, in Brown Driver Briggs in 1907, they say it's a loan word from Assyrian, title of Assyrian general, meaning field marshal. Aha. Okay. 
So we're constantly adding nuance to our understanding of words. Will this change your life? No, but I think it's interesting to understand, you know, why newer translations are different and why it's not the kind of thing where we want to just say, oh, well, the newer translations changed everything. You know, that's not what happened. It was the newer translators learned things about the languages and incorporated, incorporated that into the languages. So this also, by the way, this is where I want to end. This also should exist, should um, impact the lexicons we use. I don't know if you were thinking about that. Strong's published in 1890 should give way to Brown Driver Briggs. You know, we, sh we should be looking at Brown Driver Briggs because that can incorporate the cognate languages where Strong's does not. So when you're looking on Blue Letter Bible, don't look at what's the Strong's definition. Look at what's the Brown Driver Briggs definition. And really, you know, that this one now, this one's even uh, newer. This is Kohler and Baumgartner, the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. So this one's considered even uh, more up to date than Brown Driver Briggs. It was just published a few years ago. Uh, so you can check that one out if you want, although it's like $200 if you buy it. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, you probably want to save up for a few years and <laughs> eat a lot of ramen or something. So, so that, uh, that's in the Hebrew. For Strong's in the New Testament, we could use this. This is a, a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. So this outside of Strong's incorporates early Christian literature, which can sometimes be helpful. It can also show you some of the weird ways that some of the church fathers used uh, some of the vocabulary words, show you some of their doctrinal bias. And here's another one that's also considered good and modern or up to date is a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament based on semantic domains. You can pick this one up for about $30. Um, this is by Lou and Nida, L-O-U-W and Nida. Um, if anybody here uses Logos, the program Logos, it's the one that we have the Christadelphian magazines on. Um, you, can, you can get this as a book there in, uh, in Logos. Okay, and then in the same vein, we should read newer translations because they're up to date. And I want to make it clear. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use the King James. It has a lot of strong points. We've talked about that in other classes. But we should know here's its weak point. So when we're reading it, we can read with that kind of awareness. And here's a strong point of some of the newer translations. So we want to know the strong points and weak points of both. Because ultimately, this is what the translators of the King James themselves would have done. So I want to close with this quote. They write, neither did we think much to consult the translators or commentators, Chaldee, Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, or Latin, no, nor the Spanish, French, Italian, or Dutch. So they were looking at all different translations of the Bible, whatever they could get their hands on, they said. Neither did we disdain to revise that which we had done. So if they found something in one of these other versions and they said, oh, you know what? We made a mistake. They said, we better revise what we wrote. And to bring back to the anvil, that which we had hammered, but having and using as great helps as were needful and fearing no repro reproach for slowness nor coveting praise for expedition, we have at length, through the good hand of the Lord upon us, brought the work to pass that you see. And I think we can take that same spirit, that same attitude, and we can read multiple translations, recognizing these are the strengths, these are the weaknesses of all of them.